Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to today's research seminar. I'm Aaron Deere, and it's absolutely a pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Kent Greenfield. Uh, Kent is a professor of law at Boston College Law School, where he teaches and writes in the areas of business law, constitutional law, decision-making theory, and legal theory. He's a graduate of Brown University and the University of Chicago Law School, and has served as a law clerk to David Souter of the United States Supreme Court. Kent began his professional career in private practice before entering the academy in 1995. And since that time, he has established himself as a leading and prolific scholar. His articles have appeared in top law reviews like the Yale Law Journal and the Virginia Law Review. And his books have been published by leading presses, including the University of Chicago Press and, most recently, Yale University Press. Um, on a personal note, I should say that it's not often that you have the opportunity to introduce one of your own intellectual idols. Um, Kent's writing in the field of corporate accountability has been hugely influential on me and has been a constant source of inspiration. Um, in particular, his book, um, his first book, uh, The Failure of Corporate Law, is a book that sits consistently um, on my desk as I'm working. Um, after its release, one reviewer called it simply the best and most well-reasoned progressive critique of corporate law yet written. Uh, before I give the floor to Kent, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Associate Dean Puri, to the Hennick Center for Law and Business, and to our fabulous research events coordinator, Jody Ann Rowe Butler. Um, everyone's support has been invaluable, and Kent's visit actually includes another lecture uh, later this afternoon at one of the downtown firms, so we're certainly making him sing for his supper. Um, Please join me in welcoming Professor Ken Greenfield. Thanks, Aaron. It, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here in Toronto on one of the, uh, such a pretty day. Uh, thanks to Aaron for inviting me and making this possible. He's a, he's a real star, a rising star in the world of, of uh, corporate governance law, uh, and it's it's flattering for me to hear you say those things to me. Uh, also, thanks to uh, Dean Puri for uh, putting, for making it possible for me to be here, and also to Jody Ann who made the administration of this trip so easy, which is um, which is a huge success. Um, and and thanks to whomever provided the the food, since that's I know that's really the, real, the reason that you're all here, uh, uh, but that's that's fine. I'm used to. Uh, uh, to understanding the nature of constrained choices, uh, so 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 it's it's uh, I, I appreciate you being here. So I, I'm here to to talk about the myth of choice, and I'll start with with my thesis, which uh, like many things can be summed up uh, with a New Yorker cartoon. Uh, you can be anything you want to be, no limits, says the uh, the mother goldfish to the baby goldfish in the middle of the, the fishbowl. Um, and so my, my talk today is, to, uh, is, the, the, is meant to uh, argue that this is, this is a better description of, of what we experience in, in, in our lives than we might otherwise think and what to do about it. So, uh, so that's, that's, that's my thesis. Now, the reason why uh, I, I'm, I've been obsessed with the, um, the, the concept of choice is because it's all around us. And once I started uh, looking into it, it's everywhere. And if you can see the screen, this is, uh, this is Burger King's uh, slogan. And I have it your way, right? It's, it's ubiquitous. We know, we, know this, we know this slogan. They brought this back uh, a few years ago because they said that uh, uh, Self-realization is in right now. So, uh, so, so um, that that was their marketing team. Uh, so, I guess if you ha want a little more tomatoes on your Whopper, you're becoming self-realized in a very important way. Um, and, and, but the important thing is that choice is in, 
and choices in uh, if you want to have uh, television uh, for direct TV, the, the, the ultimate package for direct TV, the satellite uh, television is called the choice package. Uh, it gives you over 225 channels. This is also, it's very revealing, right? We, we want to have that many choices, but the typical viewer, do you want to guess how many channels the typical subscriber actually watches? Five is, is, is a good guess. It's a little low. It's about 16, right? So we want to feel like we have choice even though we don't exercise it, right? At, at our home, it's, it's ESPN. If, if the Red Sox are losing or, or, if, or, it's, um, or the Patriots are winning um, or, or it's whatever vampire show my, my wife is watching at the moment. <laughs> uh, but it's really just a few, it's a few um, narrow choices. But we love choice so much, it's used to advertise a bunch of things, you know, from, from strollers to uh, awards to insurance to uh, windows to cigarettes uh, to games to hi-fi, who uses that anymore, to condoms, uh, and, and even to, uh, to country music collections, uh, the Campus Boogie Collector's Choice uh, version of, of, of country music. Now, here's one, li one little uh, f uh, I ironic twist. About a year ago, I started going around and lecturing about this book. And my first trip was to Chicago, so I landed at O'Hare and uh, exited the plane, got in line for the taxi. Uh, um, to get my taxi to downtown. And of course, they allocate you a taxi, uh, whether you like it or not, right? You, you just get in line and the next one that comes up. So the one that I had allocated to me was uh, this one, uh, uh, Choice Taxi, which was given to me um, by, by, just because of, by randomness. So thereby proving my point, right? Um, so, so choice is not always what it's cracked up to be. So, and, and we love choice so much uh, even when it has consequences. Here's, a, here's an Alec Baldwin commercial. You know, they say TV will rot your brain. <laughs> That's absurd. TV only softens the brain like a ripe banana to take it all the way. We've created Hulu. Hulu beams TV directly to your portable computing devices anytime, anywhere, for free. <laughs> and once your brain's reduced to a cottage cheese like mush, we'll scoop them out and gobble them up. Because we're aliens. And that's how we roll. Hulu, an evil plot to destroy the world. Enjoy. Right, so, uh, so, so even when choice has consequences, we, we seem to love it even when it turns your brain to mush. Uh, and we love, we love choice so much, we love it even for our chickens. Now, I don't know if you can see this very well. This is the back of a package that I bought at uh, Trader Joe's recently. Do you guys have Trader Joe's here in Toronto? So it's a, it's a, it's a great grocery store. We're so superior to, to you because we have it. Um, but, but it's like this, you know, this, na uh, this natural uh, 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 grocery store. But the, th this is a package of hard-boiled, hard pre-hard-boiled eggs, which is convenient, right? Because who has time to boil the things? Um, <laughs> so, the, um, but what's, what's one reason to buy to buy these uh, these eggs is that our eggs are made from hens that live in a more natural environment, not in cages. They are free to perch, scratch, and nest wherever they choose. Um, so choice is good for us. Choice is good for uh, chickens. And that makes everybody's lives better. Um, of course, the, my, one of the things that I want to uh, talk about are the problems with choice. Uh, it's not altogether clear that choice is always um, uh, such a good thing. So here's one uh, example. There's a famous experiment that had to do with jams. All right, so uh, this one store offered three jams uh, to sample and, uh, and to buy, and another store offered a couple dozen jams to, to sample and buy. Right, so one store with three, one store with 24 or so. So which store do you think sold more jam? The one with three. The one with three, why? Right, like human beings are really easily overwhelmed, right? Um, so the one, th one thing we know is that you can choose among three jams, right? But it's, I mean, you know whether you like strawberry as, a, as opposed to blackberry. But when it gets really complicated, do you like strawberry boysenberry as opposed to uh, you know, ra raspberry 
apricot, you know, who really knows? And once you start sampling them, is, it gets confusing. Uh, so, it's, so if you want to sell jam, it's better if you have a, a few narrow choices rather than a lot. And what's interesting about this study is that not only did the store that's offered fewer choices sell more, when asked a week later, uh, the people who actually bought jam were more satisfied if they had chosen from the three, group of three, than from the group of two dozen. Because they weren't uh, worried that they had gotten it wrong. Right? So if you have a lot of choices, there's a lot more regret, potential regret, in the choices that you actually make. So people, um, so one, that's one reason with uh, one problem with choice. It can often be overwhelming. Now, uh, another problem with choice is that it's sometimes not genuine. Um, and uh, oh, actually, back to the overwhelming part. So th this is my dog, Murphy. Uh, and Murphy is a, a, a complete uh, member of our family. Um, uh, but he sheds like the Dickens, right? So our, our, our house is full of white hair. Uh, so my wife and I went to buy a vacuum cleaner at the local Best Buy. And it literally took us an hour. We stood there for an hour trying to figure out which vacuum cleaner to buy. She's, she's a, a partner at a law firm in Boston. I'm a law professor. It's not like you know uh, uh, we didn't come unarmed with synapses to fire. But, but we, uh, we could not make a decision about which, which vacuum to purchase. And after an hour, she threw up her arm, threw up her, literally threw up her hands and said, I can't, I can't make this decision. And I, so I, I grabbed her by the arm. I was like, "I'm writing a book about choice. We cannot leave the, uh, we cannot leave the store without making a decision about this." Uh, so we uh, bought a vacuum, which I ended up taking back a week later, uh, because because it didn't really satisfy us. So, uh, so we were a great example of the jam ex of experiment because we had a lot of choices. We couldn't decide, and once we decided, uh, we were full of regret about what we chose. So. Uh, the, uh, another problem with choice is that choice is not, uh, sometimes not genuine. This is a picture of, of a Red Sox player named Darren Lewis. Darren Lewis um, uh, was on the Red Sox back in the late 90s. Um, and one, one day he, uh, uh, when he went up to bat, he, um, uh, he fouled off a ball. And it was a fastball, and it went right into the stands. And it was going about 90 miles an hour when it uh, when it came off his bat. And so it went directly at a, a woman named Jane Costa. Um, now, Ms. Costa had never been to a baseball game before. She had just sat down in her seat. Um, she was sitting right behind the Red Sox dugout, and the ball um, hit her square in the face and uh, injured her severely and um, uh, crushed her facial bones. And she ended up um, having to undergo a number of surgeries, which cost her about a half a million dollars. She ended up suing the Red Sox um, for this. And uh, I mean, suing the Red Sox in a Boston court. Um, it's like suing the Vatican, uh, suing the Pope in the Vatican, right? So it's not, it's not a high probability of victory. And, and in fact, she did not win, in part because the court said that she had made the choice uh, to accept the risk when she entered the baseball park. Uh, you know, and, and, and if you go to, uh, a, a baseball uh, game. It will. There is a waiver on the back of the ticket, written really, really small language, um, uh, in small text, and it, and the court made its decision uh, on that basis. And the the point, though, is that it, we might assume as lawyers, uh, we might project onto her a choice, or might might decide that as a matter of legal. Um, Reasoning, it makes sense to say that she made a choice, but she, I think it's incorrect as a factual matter that she made the choice to accept the risk. First of all, I, before I was uh, writing this book, I didn't know how dangerous it is to go spectate a baseball game. Uh, as it turns out, about 300 people are injured seriously every year at Major League Baseball games. Um, so probably 10 per, uh, you know, more or less 10 per, uh, per team per year. And it's, um, uh, and other uh, countries protect spectators at baseball games differently than we do. We, uh, in Japan, for example, there are nets all around the field rather than um, just behind the, the home plate. So, so the, the point is, is that while we, while we might assume for the sake of legal argument that choice exists, often choice does not exist in fact or might not exist in fact. Um, so, but the, uh, 
one other, so another category of problems um, with choice, not just problems being, uh, over, that, that choice is often overwhelming, choice is not often genuine, there are a ton of limits on choice. And so these limits uh, include, uh, fall in a number of categories, which I talk about in the, in the book, one of which is the brain. So there's a lot of um, cutting edge neuroscience going on that, that, are, that legal scholars are starting to pay attention to. And the reason is that legal, um, the, the neuroscientists and the psychologists are showing a bunch of um, different influences that, um, uh, that spring from the way our brains work. And these influences uh, affect how we make choices. And they, they, happen, they, they, they occur at a uh, subconscious level. So just, to, just here are some examples. The familiarity effect uh, is simply the notion that we like things that are familiar, uh, that, and, and we prefer things that are familiar, and we believe things that are familiar, and especially in moments of stress or danger. Uh, so so, so think, think about what this means in moments after, say, 9-11 in, in the United States. Right? You, uh, especially in moments of stress and danger, you, 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 feel, you like things, believe things uh, uh, um, uh, that are familiar to you. Confirmation bias is simply the notion that um, we see in the world around us facts that coincide with what we already believe. Right? It's, it's simply that, and it's not just that we, um, uh, we interpret facts in a way that, uh, that co coincides with what we believe. We actually see facts in ways that we, and we ignore other facts that, we, uh, that don't fit with what we already believe. There's an attractiveness effect. Uh, uh, people believe, you know, like, if like jurors believe witnesses who are attractive and disbelieve witnesses that are unattractive and believe that uh, defendants, for example, are attractive, bad acts, were, um, were an aberration. And people who are, defendants who are attractive, jurors tend to believe that, um, that uh, I'm sorry, uh, defendants that are unattractive, jurors tend to believe that bad acts that they committed uh, fit with their underlying personality. Um, there's a framing effect. Now, a framing effect is simply that, that um, I, it's the power of suggestion, right? Marketers know this really well. It's why sale prices work. Right, because you, you, the sale price is framed with regard to the regular price. I get this. Um, uh, I get this catalog. I got this catalog the other day. This is um, this is like a shirt, like a shirt catalog. Because I, I bought one shirt there, or two shirts there, maybe two years ago. So I get a catalog every month from this uh, this sh shirt um, uh, retailer. And every month, it's like save hundred dollars or more if you, you know if you buy the next ten days only. Right, so um, the, the, the shirts are usually 160, but this week you can get them for 39.50. And I swear, every month I get this, I think I, I find myself thinking, I really need to go buy this shirt because it's on, you know, it's usually 160, but it's uh, but it's on sale for 40. This is the power of the framing effect, which uh, marketers know how to use very uh, very well. Uh, memory and future problems. Uh, humans are really bad at remembering things and even worse at predicting the future, uh, mostly because the, uh, in in, with regard to memory, there's too much data for our brains to record. So our brains record and store the salient aspects, usually the first things that happen, the last things that happen, the highs and the lows, and everything else is filled in later. This is one reason why eyewitness testimony is really, really valuable. Because, um, uh, because a lot of the, the data is not actually stored and is projected after the fact from what you assume to be the case. Um, we're also easily distracted. Uh, and, and, it's, um, uh, and our brain works, uh, doesn't work well when we are uh, distracted. This is why I, I ban laptops in my classrooms. Does that make me a bad professor? Um, uh, uh, but but um, uh, because because it's easy, I, I find it that students uh, learn better when they're not checking their email or or uh, on Facebook. Uh, call me crazy. Um, uh, so so but so here's I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a test about how well you can focus. 
Okay, so uh, the next screen is, is a video. And this, this video, uh, some of you may already have seen this video, in which case I just ask you just to, um, uh, to, to stay quiet while we watch it. It's, it's a test of your eyewitness ability. And, it's, um, and so there are going to be two groups uh, of people passing a basketball among themselves, one group, uh, uh, one group dressed in white, one group dressed in black. All right, I want you, to, want you to watch the group dressed in white and count the number of baseball passes that the group in white passes among themselves, OK? So count the um, passes of the group wearing white. So some of you have seen that before, I'm sure. Um, but uh, for those of you who haven't, um, uh, how many pa who, who counted 13 or fewer passes? 14? 15? 16? 17? More than 17? All right, so the correct answer is 15. Uh, so that's one, one, um, uh, one thing to notice right away, right? There's a, there's a, big, there's a big bell curve of people uh, even in this room, counting the passes, um, and and what else? What else was there? Gorilla. There was a, there was a gorilla. Now did every, <laughs> so I ha, so who did not see a gorilla? Please. Ad, <laughs> all right. So let's watch it again. Okay, so, so the first time I saw this, I, I didn't see the gorilla either, right? And, uh, and I, find, I find this really, really fascinating, with, especially with you law students, because the reason you guys are successful is because you know how to focus, right? Um, and so you, I bet you're missing a lot of gorillas, right? Because, because uh, especially when a professor tells you what to focus on, that it's a test, that you know, it's a test of your eyewitness ability. I can to I totally framed the, the the question, and suckered you in to focus on one thing and, and to ignore everything else. And what you did, you ignored a guy in a gorilla suit beating his chest in the middle of the screen. <laughs> right. So so it it's uh, it's it's just a uh, uh, piece of evidence of how. Um, uh, our brains work in certain circumstances, you know, especially in um, uh, moments of, of tension or when, when you're really trying to focus on something else. It's easy to miss other things, but your brain does capture it in various ways. Here's an, um, here's an example. Here's a, um, a, a portion of a commercial in the 2000 Bush v. Gore race. Um, watch, th watch this. Commercial. And Al Gore, Gore opposed bipartisan reform. He's pushing a big government plan that lets Washington bureaucrats interfere with what your doctors prescribe. The Gore prescription plan, bureaucrats decide. The Bush prescription plan, seniors choose. Anybody see anything in there? Rats. Rats. For one thirtieth of a second, uh, this fills the screen. When the word bureaucrats rushes in, this fills the screen. Um, so, uh, you know, and studies show that your, your, your eye and your brain will actually react to it even though you don't see it uh, consciously. And it will associate, your brain associates, there's a part of your brain that processes disgust. Rats often trigger that. It does with me. I'll tell you a story later. Uh, uh, but, but uh, and, and this was done by, um, um, by the 
Bush campaign, they spent over uh, almost $202.5 million to run this ad in various places, including in Florida. Um, you know, who knows? But you might remember that uh, our 2000 election in Florida was decided by a handful of votes. Um, our national election was decided by a handful of votes in Florida. So it's, under, it's, it's unclear what the impact of this is. But it is clear that our brains would react, and our brains don't always react uh, the way we might expect them to. So that's one limit of, um, of, the, of the way we deal with choice, is because of the way our brains work. Now, another way we deal with choice is, uh, is choice and authority. Now, the thesis here is that, in, in, in fact, we have um, uh, our brains react to authority figures in, in uh, predictable ways. Now, the most famous study uh, uh, to date on this is the, the, the study that was done in uh, New Haven in the 60s. Those are, these are some old photographs. And some of you have already you probably studied this in, in, psych, in uh, introductory psychology class. But uh, this is a study run by Stanley Milgram. And what would happen would be you would have asked for volunteers. And ostensibly, the, the, the study was about the impact of, of uh, punishment on learning. So you'd take one of the volunteers, and you'd, you'd strap him in to, these, um, uh, to, these, to this chair where you have a little electrodes on their, on their wrists. And the other person would go in the other room uh, and sit in front of this uh, console that uh, he was told was linked to the electrodes on the wrist. And it started with 15 volts and went all the way up to 450 volts. And so the, the test, and so how it worked, was um, this person actually was a confederate, was, not, was, um, was in on the game. And the, elect electro the electrodes were not, in fact, hooked up. Um, but the person throwing the switches thought they were. And so every time the, there, was a, there was a quiz, and every time this person got an answer wrong, this person was told by an official looking man in a, in a white lab coat that, he, that they had to go up the, uh, the console and, and shock the person with increasingly severe, uh, severe shocks. So the shocks started at 15 votes, which are quite mild. Um, and, then, and then they kept going up. And, and they were labeled, which you can't really see on this photograph, but they're labeled you know, mild, moderate, um, uh, severe, extreme. Uh, 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 dangerous, and then finally the last three ones were just labeled XX. Um, and there was a whole script that, that they went through. And, one of, and, and so what happened, at 150 volts, the person uh, strapped in was supposed to start yelling, get me out of here, I uh, refuse to go on. And the experimenter in the white lab coat would always say, you have no choice, you must continue. Now, there was nothing constraining the person um, from getting up and, and leaving. And so um, really, they did have a choice. But the authority figure would tell them that, that they had to go on. And, the, and the, the question was, how far would people go? And before the experiment was run, Milgram asked a bunch of psychologists and psychiatrists what they predicted would be the answer. And the prediction was you know, maybe 1 in 100 would go all the way to the, to the top. Um, but that most people would refuse. Now, Milgram, um, uh, in fact, found that uh, a, a, a big majority of the, um, of the, of the, the te so-called teachers would, in fact, continue to obey uh, after the learner refused. And 60% went all the way to the end, where they thought they were administering a lethal shock to, to, another, to a stranger to another volunteer because they were getting answers wrong on a quiz. Now, the, now, Milgram did this in part to figure out what had happened in the concentration camps in, in Nazi Germany. Why would people obey um, uh, an authority figure? And what he learned is, is that you could really constrain, you could um, uh, manipulate the numbers. He, all, he did learn that uh, even 30% of the respondents would obeyed all the way to the top, even if they had to hold the arm of the other person on a shock plate. Um, he also found that you could manipulate the numbers by doing various things. If you put somebody else in the room who uh, was, going, was going along, 
who did not dissent, who, who also obeyed, he could get obedience rates over 90%. So peer pressure matters, or the situation matters. If you put somebody in the room who, who started objecting, who started dissenting, obedience rates fell drastically. So uh, we, we know from Milgram's experiments that what other people doing, are doing around you matters quite a bit. Now, one might think this is, this is um, uh, you know, this is an old experiment. It's not really relevant anymore. Um, for goodness sake, it was, it was at Yale. Uh, you know, how can we generalize? Uh, but but as, as it turns out, there have been a number of, of experimenters who have replicated these re results, um, including uh, a, a recent French documentary that mimicked this situation in a, in a game show that they, that they uh, rigged up and where they got a volunteer from the audience who was in on the game Put them, put them in, um, put them in a uh, soundproof booth where he was supposed to answer the questions by by um, uh, uh, pushing various buttons, and then the, get somebody else from the, from the crowd to come down and shock them if they got something wrong. And this documentary, um, they got the uh, obedience rates that mimicked what Milgram did. So you had the crowd screaming, you know, shock him, shock him. <laughs> Um, uh, while while this was uh, while the the contestants were shocking someone with what they thought was a lethal dose of electricity for getting a question wrong. Um, now, so and people respond to authority even when it's um, uh, to the, to their own detriment, not just to others. This is a picture of James Arthur Ray. James Arthur Ray um, is a uh, is a famous self help guru in the states. Um, he was on Oprah. He had some uh, best-selling books, uh, and people pay for a while. People were paying ten thousand dollars to him, so that they could go to a retreat that he ran in Sedona, Arizona. Now, Sedona, Arizona is, is known to be this place where um, uh, some people believe there are all these energies come together. I'm not really sure why, but um, but people will pay ten thousand dollars to go and uh, have him help them get control of their lives. So what happened this time, uh, this is about four years ago now, um, at the end of the week, he sent them out into the desert for 36 hours with no, uh, no food or water, and then came back and put them in a sweat lodge where they were supposed to um, sweat out their impurities and to really come to terms with their mortality. Um, so the sweat lodge was heated by hot rocks. Um, he sat by the tent flap and, um, and, and belittled people if they tried to leave. Is it, and the reason why we're talking about it is that three people died. Uh, and they died in part because they respected his authority so much that they would rather suffer uh, uh, a scorching of internal organs than, su than suffer his belittlement as they left the tent flap. And James Arthur Ray was just uh, convicted last year of, uh, uh, of involuntary man, uh, 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 homicide, I'm sorry, negligent homicide, because the jury understood what we're talking about. Because the jury understood that even though people could have stood up and left, that he was, and, and he wasn't constraining them in the sense that he was not tying them down, but his authority was enough of a constraint that he bore responsibility for their deaths. Um, this, this explains, you know, our uh, people's adherence to authority is one reason why, um, one reason why uh, sexual harassment law is so important, right? So uh, uh, um, bosses, uh, other people in, in authority have control over other people uh, in various, uh, at, least, at least they have a lot of influence over other people that can be taken um, uh, taken advantage of. So uh, another source of constraint for, uh, for choice is markets. Uh, and when I say that, uh, when I talk about markets, you know, one of the things that, that uh, economy, and I did go to University of Chicago Law School where um, markets are, are uh, uh, idolized. And, and markets are seen as the, uh, the epitome of choice. Markets depend on choice. Markets provide choice. And of course, the, the reality, though, is for most, for many people in the world, markets are a source, source of choicelessness rather than choice, in the sense that if markets allocate goods according to who can pay, if you don't have anything to pay with, markets are not a source of choice. They're a source of limit. 
So uh, I'm a believer in markets, but I'm also a believer in limiting markets. Uh, about half of the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. So markets are not a source of, uh, of, of power for those people. My, my grandfather was a coal miner. Um, I'm, one of my earliest memories is, is going with my grandmother to, uh, to the company store in Kentucky where, where she paid for her groceries with, with scrip. Uh, which is um, uh, a form of payment that is now illegal. It was the um, it was um, payment that was given to the coal miners by the company as their wage, and and but they could only spend it at the company store to buy groceries and the like. So um, it was it was it wasn't. Um, um, coercive in the sense that you know, my, my grandfather could have quit and gone on and moved somewhere else. But it was coercive in the sense that it's, um, uh, that was, in fact, his only choice. Uh, there's another, there's another uh, source of limit on, uh, with, with markets. And uh, have, you ever, have you seen this movie, Superbad? It's a great movie. Uh, so he, here's why this is relevant. Um, there's, there's a part of our brain that, um, uh, that we, we non-specialists could call the pleasure center. And it, and it can, basically it can be triggered in various ways. And with, if the brain is, if the pleasure center of the brain is triggered, um, uh, the brain ex uh, wants to be satisfied. And that desire to be satisfied can be easily transferred. Uh, so here's, here's how this uh, is used by marketers. So if you're attracted to women, one way to tr trigger the, the, um, the pleasure center is to show you a picture of an attractive woman. Um, and once that pleasure center is triggered, then it can be satisfied in, uh, in various ways, say by drinking a beer. This is why beer, beer retailers, uh, you know, that's why the St. Pauli girl looks like she does. Um, this, the, and the, what the scientists say is that basically, uh, once the pleasure center is triggered, you become like a teenage boy in Superbad. You become really, really creative, and not stupid, creative, but really, really short-term oriented, uh, because you want to satisfy your, your, um, your craving. And it can be satisfied in various ways. And if the thing that triggers the pleasure center isn't available, then it's transferred to other, other um, uh, other items. This is why uh, you, many of you probably have, have never uh, uh, bought or sold a home yet, but do you happen to know what uh, real estate agents will always tell you to do if you're trying to sell your home? Bake cookies. Bake cookies, right? Because w w if you come into a, if, right, if you come into, a, come into a home for sale and smell the cookies, it triggers the pleasure, pleasure center in your brain. This is why department stores, what's always the first thing you see in a fancy department store, as you walk in the door, the perfume counter, right? Um, so so uh, it, triggers the, uh, it triggers that part of the brain. So the reason why I, I use this as an example is because markets incentivize manipulation of people's purchasing decisions, even at the level of subconsciousness, right? Um, and they take advantage of it. Uh, the other thing that, that where markets uh, and choice uh, are, are brought to bear is that often markets um, commodify things that we don't want commodified. They, they have no natural stopping point. And so they infringe choice in that way, because there are some things that we don't want to commodify. Uh, one example of that is body organs. Uh, this is a, a photograph of four men who have sold a kidney. You might be able to see their scars. In many places in the world, kidneys, um, there's actually a pretty robust black market in body organs, including kidneys. Kidneys can, are um, often bought for about $1,500, which is uh, more than an annual income for many people in, um, in many parts of the world. Uh, and can be sold uh, for upwards of $150,000. So there's a big market, um, black market, for kidneys. Also, uh, sex trafficking is another example of this, the things that are commodified that we don't want commodified. About a million children are trafficked every year for sex, um, half of whom are under the age of 16. Um, so 
the, the notion that markets are the place where freedom resides is only true in a very um, a rudimentary and simplistic um, form. Uh, the, the last category, which I'll uh, talk about, and then we can, we can open it up to, to, to some questions, I know, is um, culture. Now, uh, when I say culture, I don't mean the symphony. Um, I mean, like, our surroundings. And you think back on that, the New Yorker cartoon that started the presentation with the, uh, the two fish in the fishbowl. Culture is a lot like that fishbowl. We don't, we don't sense the, the choices that are being made for us uh, without our knowledge. Here's another New Yorker cartoon um, that helps explain this. I don't know if you can see this. The, the lemmings running over the cliff, uh, and one says to the other, look, I have my misgivings too, but what choice do we have except to stay the course? Um, so w in some ways, culture provides that, um, that push for all of us, and we don't, um, and so sometimes choice looks, um, Sometimes decisions look like choice when they might be um, more coerced than choice. You know, my, uh, I, think, I think it's an open question whether uh, uh, to what extent uh, uh, women wearing a burqa uh, can be seen as uh, choosing that, depending on uh, the situation. Um, uh, of course, we have our own uh, uh, sex and, and, and uh, uh, clothing norms uh, here in the West, this is a picture of a high school senior in uh, Mississippi who uh, who had who was prohibited from having this photograph uh, appear in the senior yearbook uh, because this um, this is a this is a girl. This is Sierra Sturgis, and she was banned. Her picture was banned from the yearbook because she wasn't satisfying the the gender norms of her high school in Mississippi. Um, the the ha the the happy ending to this story is that her, her mother bought a full page ad in the yearbook and put this put this photograph as the as the ad which i think is a great parenting move right so the the point is that that much much of our culture um, decide uh, constrains us you know this is a photograph from the usual suspects you know this is another uh, this is another place where where our culture um, it, it, uh, has implications my my wife um, uh, came upon a, um, uh, an attempted carjacking in Boston a couple years ago. Uh, she walked up on it with another woman, and uh, the, the assailant was wielding a knife, trying to get the woman out of the car. Um, the valet uh, attendant, who was right there, uh, defended the woman with, a, with an umbrella, chased the man with the knife up the street with his umbrella, um, and as my wife um, assisted the, the woman who had been attacked, the other woman who had came out on the scene called 911. And her call to 911 was um, the, an African-American male, the assailant, is running up the street with a knife. It was the valet with the umbrella who was the African-American male. And, it was the, and the assailant was a white man. Um, but the woman who came upon the scene, seeing a black man run away from, uh, from a crime scene, assumed that it was the black man who was the assailant, not, not the, the white man. So this, this happens all the time with eyewitness testimonies, eyewitness testimony, in part because uh, our cultural presumptions affect what we see. Um, so uh, another example of this is, is there's a, a fascinating study uh, about date rape. There's a, uh, um, uh, there, there's a study that shows the, uh, the, the person most likely to believe the male in a date rape setting, date rape trial, is actually a woman, uh, are actually women from traditional backgrounds. Uh, and women from traditional backgrounds, or culturally traditional backgrounds, where, where the family has the man at the head, uh, the woman in a more subservient position, uh, they tend to believe that uh, the woman's no did not really mean no. So uh, in some ways, culture uh, affects how you see the world around us. So, uh, so what do we do? Uh, uh, let me bypass that. What, what, what do we do? Well, a couple of, couple of things, and, um, and, and I'll just, a couple of ideas, and then we'll open up for more questions. Um, I think one thing we can do as a matter of 
personal, um, uh, personal responsibility and, and personal choice is that to acknowledge the power of situation. That, you know, even though our rhetoric is all about choice and freedom, often we've got to acknowledge that people's um, uh, choices are affected by situation. And once we understand that, uh, we, we uh, are better able to make good decisions. If we, if we know our irrationalities, we'll be better, be better able to, um, uh, to, to deal with them. So here, here's one example of this. Uh, this is my chicken parm story. All right, so, um, humans, like I said earlier, humans are really bad at anticipating the future, even anticipating their own uh, preferences in the future. And one example of a study that I read while doing this, uh, doing this book is, is uh, you ask a bunch of people who are, who are going to go to a conference for uh, they were, they were several days long. And you ask them what they wanted for a snack. And people anticipate in the future that they will want a variety of things. But when the day comes to have the snack, they all want their favorite thing. So you would, all, you, would, you would put her out a variety of things every day, and people would tend to get their favorite thing. So, so, this, is, uh, so this is why uh, it's relevant to my shopping. So I, I used to, you know, I, I would go to, the, go to the grocery store, and you would buy you know, frozen dinners for those nights when you're by yourself, and you, have to have, and you can't do anything else. Um, you get home late, and you have to have some. You know, I would always buy a variety of things. Um, and then when I would get home, I would eat the chicken parm the first night, because that's my favorite. And then the second night, when I would open up the freezer, the chicken parm would be gone, and I would be disappointed. Right? I, um, at the store, I thought I wanted variety, but at home, I wanted chicken parm. Um, and so what I, after I started researching this book, I started um, uh, buying only chicken parm. Uh, so, so, now, so now, you know, I've got several chicken parms in my freezer, but every time I go to the freezer to eat dinner, uh, eat a frozen dinner, I've got my favorite, chicken parm. So one of, the re one, of the th one of the takeaways for me has been anticipate your own irrationalities um, and don't think of yourself as being um, uh, more nuanced than you, than you actually are. And maybe um, uh, not, not to expect too much. This is a, another one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons. It says, um, no, I don't want to change you, Daryl, but sure, it would be great if you were completely different. Um, and, and I'm sure that a lot of us in relationships have had this feeling once in a while um, or have been uh, said things. Uh, uh. So one, one example, so, so this, I think this is true. Uh, the other thing with regard to politics and the law, uh, and just a couple more words and then I'll be done, is um, I think uh, we fetishize choice too much in the law. We assume that people's choices necessarily need to be deferred to without taking into account the constraints that those choices um, are a product of. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, the law should take this into account and implement uh, different uh, nudges, uh, to, to coin a phrase, or, to even, or even mandates. I think the, the debate in the United States over the individual mandate, for example, is uh, I think it's misguided. It's all about individual freedom, you know, people don't want to be forced to buy insurance. Uh, I think that that's um, a, a misguided way to frame that debate. I think another thing that we can do for, um, uh, as, a, as a matter of policy and politics, is that we should um, encourage dissent. Uh, I think one thing that's clear from the Milgram studies and others is that people uh, in diverse groups where dissent is recognized and empowered, make better decisions, or at least think about their decisions in different ways. Uh, this is some of the work that Professor Deere does uh, so importantly in the, in the corporate governance world. Um, we can ask people for more public commitments uh, in order to, to um, submit uh, current con commitments into the future. And I think maybe most um, uh, importantly, we can uh, uh, take a different view of personal responsibility. Um, it, do you remember this movie, Collateral? It's a Tom Cruise movie with Jamie Foxx. Um, I don't know why that TV is uh, out, out of focus, but um, this is the, Tom Cruise plays the assassin, right? He, he kidnaps Jamie Foxx, who's, the, who's a taxi cab driver, and, and forces Jamie Foxx to um, uh, drive him around where, uh, during a night in LA where, uh, during which Tom Cruise kills a bunch of people. And the, his first assassination is this guy up in a, an apartment building. And, Tom, and the guy, uh, Tom Cruise shoots him, and he falls off the balcony, lands on top of 
um, uh, Jamie Foxx's car. Jamie Foxx screams, runs out of the car, and starts, you know, and Tom Cruise comes back out and says, um, and Jamie Foxx says, um, you killed him, you killed him. And Tom Cruise says, no, I shot him. The bullet and the fall killed him. Um, and I feel like that in some ways, Tom Cruise is, uh, Tom Cruise's statement, statement epitomizes the way we try to avoid responsibility sometimes. Right? Uh, that we say that the, the only thing that really calls something is the last actor in the causal chain. And one thing that we lawyers are pretty good at is understanding um, uh, a more robust story of causation and proximate cause. And I think as a political matter, often, at least, at least in the United States, we talk about personal responsibility as a way to relieve people of shared responsibility. That people are um, poor or unemployed or don't have health care or, or, um, uh, uh, or otherwise in dire straits because they have made bad decisions. And what that does is that relieves everybody else who helped create the situation in which those bad decisions were made uh, from any responsibility. So uh, in some ways, I'm, I, my book is a call for uh, a wider view of responsibility. And this is uh, Smokey the Bear's wife saying to Smokey, only I can prevent forest fires. Don't you think you should share some of the responsibility? Uh, so so my, my takeaway from the book is that uh, often our rhetoric of personal responsibility is uh, a cover for those who want to avoid shared responsibility. And I think we want, I, I, I think we should think more in terms of our shared responsibility to, to one another um, as we think about the, uh, the constraints on choice. So that's what I've got. Thank you. Um, so thanks so much, Ken, for a very thought-provoking talk. I still cannot believe that I did not see the gorilla. <laughs> uh, let's open the floor for questions, please. And there are mics there, Aaron. I know that, oh, you want, okay, sure. that they want you to use in order to get them recorded. Okay. Sure. Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Oh, it's just for the recording. Okay, all right. Um, thanks for that super entertaining talk. Right. Um, I'm sure this is in your book that I haven't yet had the opportunity to read, but I will. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the prescriptions uh, for regulation that come out of your uh, thesis. Yeah, um, a, a couple of things. One, one is that um, we should, uh, at least in the US, and I'm eager to hear whether how different this is here in Canada. Um, we. T as a legal matter, we often defer to people's choices um, uh, full stop, right? Um, and, and then we say that, thing, that we, we should just stop there and defer to, there, to that, those choices. But if we think about uh, one answer, one regulatory answer is to use uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler's uh, idea of nudges. So one, I, one kind of nudge is that they open their book with is simply the notion that, um, that people, like school kids, uh, when, if you want school kids to eat healthier lunches, um, uh, you should put the healthier things early in the, in the line, uh, the school lunch line. Because people tend to, to get the things in the first part of the line, because uh, that's when you're hungriest, and so you get, you get the peas and carrots. You shouldn't uh, put the macaroni and cheese first. You should put it last. Now, um, another example of a of a um, uh, of, of a nudge is is to um, uh, to have default rules that that are um, uh, that, that are already set, and because because we take advantage of the 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 truth that people use. So, are, are, how can I say it? There's a lot of inertia in decision making. So people, um, so employers should should decide what mutual funds uh, uh, their employees should invest in as a default matter. People can people can opt out, but it's better for the employer to make that decision as as a first matter of first principle. One another example of a default rule that's interesting to think about is organ donation. So um, uh, 
in the states, most, most, of, the, uh, most of the states are an opt-in uh, uh, regime for organ donation. So if you, if you get your new driver's license, you've got to sign it and say you, you're an organ donor. Now, if we change that to an opt-out system, the assumption might be that you that everybody who gets a new driver's license want, wants to be an organ donor, and you can opt out of that decision. One might say that that still protects your choice, right? People can still opt out if they don't want to donate their organs, but it takes takes um, into account and takes advantage of people's uh, aversion to, to moving off the default rule. So, so that's so that's one idea. Um, the other, so the, uh, another way. I will say this. I think Thaler and, and Sunstein don't go far enough sometimes. Uh, I think they're, they're actually probably more deferential to, um, uh, to, to nudges or use nudges more than, than I would and, and use mandates less. So uh, I, I'm not offended at all by a mandate to buy insurance, for example, um, uh, mostly because I, I think that um, uh, that to not buy insurance is such a bad decision that we sh that uh, it doesn't deserve um, a lot of credit, a lot of deference. So there's a those are those are a few answers. Other questions. Hi, thanks, Kent, for a really interesting okay. presentation. Um, on the question of whether to defer to people's choices, it seems to me that that requires answering an underlying question about what is the utility or what is the value of choice itself. Right. And your research suggests a paradox, I think, or some, some, uh, uh, co some, some outcomes that are in tension with one another. On the one hand, you have data that shows that the more choice or the more selection people have, the worse their choices are, or the, or the more paralyzed they become mm -hmm. in making choices, walking right. away from the vacuum right. cleaner, uh, right. as you did. Uh, smart people, too. Um, and then on the other hand, you seem to be saying that choice is good, we should be promoting dissent. We Presumably, dissent encourages a greater variety of ideas, of yep. options. Yep. Why should we believe in that if we believe that a greater variety of options is quite likely going to lead to really negative outcomes? Yeah, I think it's a great question, and, and I'm not sure I have a very good answer. Um, I do, and I think it's a matter of, maybe it's a matter of degree. I, mean, I do know that, that um, a multitude of choices is quickly overwhelming, right? Uh, humans, the, the brain works in such a way that people can get exhausted by making choices. Like the, uh, the brain science shows that, that the part of your brain that, um, that makes choices is also the part of your brain that, that reg regulates um, uh, willpower. So uh, th that's why uh, stores put all the, um, the, the high profit goods right at the, right at the um, where you check out, because, you, because the part of your brain that's been making your choices in the grocery store, you know, the typical grocery store has 45,000 items. By the time you get to the, to, the, to the line, that part of your brain is literally exhausted. Um, so it's easily overwhelmable. But at the same time, I also know that, that, the, um, that the, the science shows that brains, uh, that we tend to um, uh, uh, take comfort in the familiar, take comfort in the things that we, we know, that our habits are really powerful. And so that's why I say that it's a matter of group dynamic. Uh, it's better to, uh, to stir the pot. Uh, and so even if it ends up being there being more choices uh, and more options and more different uh, kinds of ideas on the table that in the long run, as a matter of group dynamics, that's, that's better. Other questions? Perhaps I can follow up on Professor Beneshai's question just about the nudge. Do you see the value of a regulatory nudge? So let's say um, in the context of um, environmental emissions, CO2 emissions, yeah. um, rather than prohibiting um, emissions after a certain amount, you ask uh, companies to disclose them um, to the public. And is the thinking behind the nudge more so that there'll be a shaming effect 
um, that there'll be sort of critical self-reflection when you're having to put that information out into the public space, or is it more about engaging third-party stakeholders, um, civil society, shareholders, et cetera? Like, where is the sort of intent, who's the intended beneficiary? Uh, it's, it's also a great question, and, and I think, I mean, I think it's twofold. I mean, w when I think about corporate governance and how I would want to tweak corporate governance to bring some of these ideas to bear, it's about changing the decision, the, the decision maker, and, and less about disclosure. Um, but even if we think about disclosure, I guess the, I guess the issue is, is there has got to be some kind of shaming effect if disclosure is to a party with some kind of power. Um, if the disclosure is to a party with no power and no influence, it makes no difference. Um, the, the, when I was, in, when I was eight, eight years old, I got in a fist fight. It was my only fist fight of my entire life. Um, uh, it was uh, with my best friend, Paul, uh, and, we were, and we were fighting over a baseball game. And so I, I, I hit him and then started running. Um, and, then, and so he chased me down and threw me down on the ground and just basically started pummel, pummeling my face um, and until, he, until he got tired and then he let me stand up. Um, if he, like, uh, I, this may be a stupid example, but if he had been, if he disclosed to me every time he was about to hit me that he was about to hit me, there wasn't much I was going to be able to do about it, right? So disclosure only matters if the person being held down can actually fight back. Um, now, I, in terms of um, the, the changing the, the, the nature of the decision maker, I think that's a pretty powerful nudge. Uh, it's not more of a, it's, maybe it's not even best thought of as a nudge. It's thought of, um, as I was saying before, I think changing push. a push. Uh, because, uh, and this is why I believe in affirmative action. I, I think changing the nature of a group to be more diverse to have more different perspectives than it really affects the way decisions are made, um, in part because people uh, are less able to engage in groupthink. People are less able to, uh, to, to stay uh, within their own comfort um, zone. Uh, and so I, I, I think the, the, the kind of work that you're doing, the kind of work I try to do with corporate governance is, 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 a, is a direct um, uh, application of some of the things that we're talking about. Other questions? Yeah, I think there's yes. one here. So I was, just about, I was just thinking about what you had mentioned. And what I'm wondering is, wasn't the point more that the more choice that there is, the less satisfied we are with the end choice? Not necessarily that the choice is worse, that we're less satisfied with it. So maybe the availability of more choice by encouraging dissent actually just contextualizes the whole issue more. Yeah, may, maybe, although, you know, and there's and there sometimes when more choice is clearly bad, better. I mean, it, it, it may, uh, one thing that I could say is that I think we just have to be more nuanced about thinking about it in the, in the first place. You know, one, of, one, um, one thing, one way to think about this is to compare um, like the U.S. system with a parliamentary system in politics, right, where, where there's more parties. You know, in the U.S., we have two parties. The choice is, uh, uh, depending on who you talk to, either stark or, or non-existent. Um, in the parliamentary system, you have many more different groups vying for attention, and, and maybe that's, uh, and, and I'm not sure which way that cuts, but it certainly opens up, opens up a range of debate. But having said that, once you get, if you get to a system where you've got 20 or 25 political parties, it, I'm not sure that 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 adds much. Maybe I bet there's a I bet there's a um, a target number where the uh, depending on the context that makes the most sense. Another question right here. Thanks. The, um, this is wonderful. Um, Thanks. I, I think this is more in a way of an invitation for, um, if you could just reflect on the question, another question about the talk itself, because I'm not sure how much you would be willing to expand the implications of deconstruction of chores beyond um, uh, corporate law in general. But if you are, um, if you were to think about that, this is actually looked at by uh, um, more uh, extensively by 
scholars who are looking at mental disabilities mm -hmm. and challenging the idea of the necessity hmm. of guardianship because the guardian doesn't necessarily make better choices. Interesting. Many varieties of someone with not, of course, every single kind of mental disability, but some variations of that. Huh. Um, so if you were to think about this in that line and imagine that basically the positive implications of this deconstruction um, is going to be a lot, hmm. then the question is that, and again, probably it's not a question, uh, what would be the normative implications? Because it seems it could go either way, right? So we can think of the um, problems uh, yeah. of choice or limitations of choice in the sense that I just mentioned, but also the, the, when we are talking about abortion, sex-based abortion or disability-based yep. abortion, those hmm. choices on the part of the woman could be questioned as well in hmm. many different ways. So mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a question, but if you were willing to say something on that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's such a great, such a great uh, question or comment. I, I, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not sure what I can say that's uh, smarter than the question. I, I think I, I, can, I, can say, I can say this, that I'm still, even after spending a couple years writing this book, um, and, uh, and, and thinking about it and, uh, and talking about it for a year, I still don't really know what I want to do normatively. Uh, and so that, that's an admission. And, and, um, and, and the, the epigraph to start the book is actually something that I often find um, uh, uh, that I keep going back to. It's, it's a quote by Isaac Bashevis Singer. It's a, he said, we have to believe in free will. We have no choice. Um, and and I, I think in some ways, I don't really know what to do with it in, the, in the settings that you um, uh, theorize about, because I'm not sure yet how far I'm really willing to push the idea that there's, that there's no such thing as free will. I feel like that there, that there, there are still things that I do in my life that I choose. Um, but the more the neuroscience um, um, pulls the curtain aside, the more it may be that um, uh, things are being driven by, by things we don't yet understand. You know? But the neuroscience is still very young. Um, I was just talking to a guy at a party the other day and, and where the, uh, who's a neuroscientist. And, and, so, and, and I, I, in some ways, we lawyers are trying to get, I think, our head of trying to make, um, imagine the implications before the neuroscience is settled. So, that, that, so maybe that's, that's where I am too. I'm still unsettled. All right, so I think we will leave it there on that unsettling note. Great. My, <laughs> thanks for everybody for coming. Catharsis, <laughs> my thanks to all of you for coming today and actually have, excuse me, uh, small token of our appreciation for Kent, so please join me again in thanking Kent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everybody for coming.